The gates have been opened, and the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion has emerged as one of the best games of 2006. The year was 2006, and the gaming world had just been taken by storm by Bethesda's latest role-playing game, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Who's laughing now? Yes, I was in the chess club. It saw critical acclaim and was in the following year released on the PlayStation 3. This is where my young, impressionable self got his hands on it. Hello, um... And it was my very first RPG experience. But something always struck me as odd about the way me and my friends played the game. Like, we'd make a character, find a playstyle, do some quests, and then we'd get a new idea for a character and start over with a fresh one. So during 2016, 10 years after Oblivion first came out, I asked myself the question, can you complete Oblivion 100% on just one character? How long would that take? How does one even measure completion in such a massive RPG? Welcome to the recap of my 4 year journey to complete The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion 100%. It took me 250 episodes to accomplish, each about 42 minutes on average, giving the full series a runtime of 7 days, 6 hours, and 27 minutes. This recap exists for those of you without the time to watch 175 hours of Oblivion content, and those of you eager to look back at the journey we've been on. I'll also be giving out some advice, tips, and resources, in case you wish to take on a similar challenge yourself. So go grab some sweet rolls, pour yourself a glass of Tamika's Westfield wine, and get cozy as I tell you the story of how I became the champion of Cyrodiil. You've got a lot to learn. During November 2016, I began planning for the challenge in earnest, and one of the first big questions I had to answer was, what race do I play? Now this was much more than a mere cosmetic choice, because even the different genders in Oblivion start with different stats. I needed to find an optimal character, someone that would let me tackle the challenges ahead. And challenges they were, because my initial completion list looked something like this. Finish all quests, master all skills, find all map markers, clear all locations at least once, shut all oblivion gates, own all horses, upgrade all houses, invest in all stores, collect all Nurnrid plants, collect all skillbooks, and slay all unique enemies in Cyrodiil. Meanwhile, I had these limitations. I couldn't fast travel, I couldn't use big exploits or bugs, I couldn't increase my skills to trainers, and I had to play on max difficulty at all times. Max difficulty? What does that entail in Oblivion? How hard can it really be? Well, here's a level 1 character. His name is Imperius Malus. Good day. This is the first combat encounter of the game against the weakest foes in Cyrodiil. Rats. Let's see how he fares. I'm not gonna lie, I struggled to even get out of the tutorial on my initial attempts, back when I was still feeling out the challenge. And this is because the max difficulty makes the enemies deal 6 times as much damage, while you only deal 1 sixth of your regular damage. It's by far one of the most unfair ways of scaling difficulty in a game. And the divines forbid that a mud crab attacks you, because while on normal difficulty, it would take 12 hits to kill you, on max difficulty, it takes two. <coughs> two hits. It was clear I needed a plan, and a really good one. So, I looked up the different racial traits and greater powers of the different races, and here I came to realize a few key things. One, endurance is a really important stat. It determines how much health you get on level up, so the higher this stat is early game, the more health you'll have end game. I need to mind my leveling process carefully. 2. The Bretons have an insanely powerful shield spell that makes them take half physical damage for a whole minute, and they have an innate, always active 50% resistance to magic. 
So the Bretons' great racial features really made me gravitate towards them, even though they did have a very low endurance. So when the choice came between male and female Breton, I went with the female, who had a higher speed than the male, though less strength. I spent days poring over the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, learning the intricacies of Oblivion's leveling system, magic system, quests, skillbook locations, etc. Because the scariest aspect of such a big challenge, it isn't necessarily the hard-hitting enemies, but rather the fact that you can screw up the entire challenge by missing a time-sensitive quest or locking yourself out of a dungeon that contains a book you need. I had to be ready for what came next. The Let's Play series that would occupy the next four years of my life started in those cold winter months near the end of 2016, and it went beyond anything I could have ever imagined. What was I thinking? Her name was Marina Mistfire. A fiery-haired Breton battle mage with cool eyes that didn't betray the madness that lay dormant within. At the peak of my winter beard, I began the challenge, and we had our first massive obstacle, making a character that did not resemble a sun-scorched, wrinkly potato. It took some effort, but Marina Mistfire came out really well in my eyes, and her adventure was on! Emperor Uriel Septim entered our cell, he told us he had dreams about our face and spoke of our great destiny, which was kinda creepy. Now breaking out of the Imperial Prison is usually a massive yawn when you've seen the sequence a few times before, but this time was different. Oh! How do you get up here? How did the rat jump up here? What the heck? It's a safe space! The fact that we were a mage meant that we couldn't wear armor. Well, we could but it would make our spells less effective. So as we continued deeper in, we soon found ourselves battling goblins, skeletons, and a zombie who legitimately gave me nightmares as a kid, all the while dressed in nothing more than our undies. Oh, this poor girl, fighting her way through the underground, in her underwear. So fitting. We fought tooth and nail and eventually made it to the end of the prison section where Emperor Uriel Septim lost his life to a Mythic Dawn assassin. He gave us the Amulet of Kings and asked us to take it to Joffrey in Coral. It was very important that it reached him. So of course, I decided to do that later. That was a common theme during the series. The fate of the world could always wait because, well, I had flowers to pick. This led to the character creation section. I began crafting the Champion class with magic as my specialization, letting me level those skills faster. I went with Intelligence and Endurance as my attributes, and Armorer, Blade, Light Armor, Marksman, Mercantile Security, and Speechcraft as my major skills. However, I would swap out Marksman with Blunt right before leaving the sewers. It was around this point I began discussing the leveling system in Oblivion, which is quite a beast to tackle. So essentially, as a quick recap, your major skills are what makes you level up. So using them a lot makes you level faster but the non-major skills can also be trained, and they give you bonuses to attributes when you level up. And you want max bonuses before you level up on this difficulty. So, you need to pick major skills that you can easily avoid using until the time is right, and make sure you only level when you have the right invisible bonuses by training appropriate skills. So, picking a magic skill as a major skill would be a bad idea for a mage because they would level uncontrollably. Are you confused yet? Great, so was I. I eventually got out of the sewers towards the end of episode 2 and that's where the skill diary was waiting. This is one of the few mods I added to the game and it helped me keep track of these invisible level up bonuses. And I highly recommend this mod to anyone wanting to level efficiently. While on the topic of mods, what mods did I use? Well, I used these. None that altered gameplay much, other than the unofficial Oblivion patch, which fixed a lot of bugs, and a mod to make selling and buying items easier, more akin to Morrowind's system, so I didn't develop Carpal Tunnel when training Mercantile. I was ready to take on the world, but first, here's a look at how the world wanted to treat us. <gasps> Did you see that? They do half your health bar! Ah, now get away from me! Get away from me, Mr. Mudcrab! and I do not have the means to fight back right now. All I have is a pathetic flare spell. Yeah, this was gonna be really, really rough, but somewhere along the way, I began developing this fondness for the pain, the punishment. It was just 
So exciting to finally get within the walls of the Imperial City in Episode 3 to buy my first summon spell, which cost me most of my money, and suddenly I had a chance against the unfair worlds. Danger was around every corner out in the wild, so a city felt like a proper refuge. Looting crates around the city for supplies became an essential strategy to stay alive. Oh, I want to raid, I want to raid, I want to steal. There are so many places, so many houses that I just want to rob. I want to get all the goods. For now though, I'm just going to rob public property. I cannot stress enough how much this made me feel immersed in the world, and I recommend giving high difficulties a shot in your own playthroughs. So, how did I fight enemies if mud crabs killed me in two blows and my fireballs had the stopping power of a wet fart? It's simple. I made someone else fight them. The summon creature spells would be my main way of fighting until I got access to the arcane university and could make my own spells. Because as it turns out, summoned creatures are not nerfed damage-wise in the same way the player is, so they are still operating at max power. Now this new strategy was put to the test as I cleared my first alien ruin in episode 4, Vilverine, a classic early game dungeon. Marina used her summon scamp to beat the crap out of any inhabitants both inside and outside the ancient ruin, and suddenly it felt like we were on more of a level playing field. This is also the episode where Marina got her first set of robes, and no longer would it be the crazy nude Breton girl, but rather the crazy robed Breton girl. With the loot from Vilverine in hand, I could sell it off for a pretty profit in the city in episode 5, and I began buying more spells so I could start training my magic skills. Because skill training would be an essential part of the next leg of the series. Thus, I began doing training sessions where I'd run around the city casting cheap spells, or stand on the shore punching mud crabs until my knuckles bled. All in the name of optimal leveling. My initial focus was on maxing endurance, speed and intelligence. I wanted more health to survive blows, more speed to avoid blows, and a higher intelligence for more magicka. However, leveling up in Oblivion comes with its own heap of troubles. Because unlike a game with very distinct level zones where you might start in an area to kill enemies from level 1 to 10 and then move on to the next area for levels 10 to 15, Oblivion has global level scaling. Meaning that the enemies in the game scale with you. If you get stronger, so do they. If you make poor leveling decisions, they don't care. They're still gonna be strong and they're gonna overpower you to the point of making the game impossible to play. So how did I fight this imbalance of power? Well, it's simple. I just didn't level. This helped offset the really harsh difficulty curve, as I could get stronger through skills, but the enemies would stay at their original power levels. Now, this did have the downside of giving me really bad rewards from quests, as well as spawning monsters with weak souls and loot, since those are both level scaled, but I could live with that. Now that Marina was ready with some basic gear and basic spells, the world was really ours to conquer. We bought a small shack down at the waterfront, which would actually be our main home for the rest of the series. However, after that purchase, we were a little tight on money, and it seemed the best way to get a quick profit was to become a thief. So we met with some shady types on the waterfront and completed our initiation into the ranks of the thieves' guilds. Don't worry about it, I got it, hee <laughs> hee. Amentius Electus' Diary. There is so much quick cash we can get early on as soon as we get access to a fence who can buy the stolen goods. Also, our first level up happened that episode, which I judged to be safe, since we were still a few levels away from enemies changing to the more dangerous variety. And, well, this level up screen right here made it clear just how diligent we had been with our leveling. A common theme to the challenge. Plus fives or busts. That was our motto. At this point, there was one major goal in particular that I set my sights on that would take the next 50 episodes to complete. I think I need something to drink. If you want to harness the true power of Oblivion's magic, you're gonna need to make custom spells. But those are locked away until you can enter the Arcane University in the Imperial City. And there was a slight snag to my dreams of getting in because it meant I needed a recommendation from every major guild hall around Cyrodiil. I'd need to visit Bruma, Coral, Chadenhall, Breville, Leowin, Skingrad, and Anvil, and help out at their local guild branch. But I had outlawed fast travel, and so 
Marina's first world tour began as we trudged the roads leading to the different cities. This was another spot in the series where I realized the immense satisfaction of self-imposed limitations. The fact that everywhere I wanted to go had to be on foot with a squishy girl who could be promptly mauled by a wolf if it got the jump on me. It made the travel so exhilarating, and every time we entered a new city we felt much like a traveler in Cyrodiil would feel. Exhausted by the journey, but eager to see what new adventures or destination held. We traveled first to Bruma, where a quest led us down a dark path. Get her, boy! Get her, Skeppy! Oh. After murdering a woman named Arnora in her own home, we were approached by a hooded man named Lucien Lachance, who gave us a chance to join the Dark Brotherhood. If we killed a man named Rufio for him. We put that off for the time being and helped solve a mysterious disappearance at the Guild Hall, which got us our first recommendation. During these first city visits, Marina also raided every home she could come across for all of their valuables and their jewelry, and this is also when we started picking up our first skill books. Wolf Queen, Volume 3, A Illusion Skill, note that down, Dark. Then the road went to Coral, where we found a monk named Joffrey that the Emperor told us about before his death. We gave him the Amulet of Kings, and he told us of a secret son the Emperor had, the last living blood of the Septum line. He was in the city of Kavach, the fate of the world was at stake, and so we decided to… Uh, let's just do it later. Marina then encountered the infamous Killing Fields quest, where you are tasked with protecting two NPCs as they defend their farm from a big goblin attack. Now the best reward in the quest is only gotten if both of the boys are alive at the end of it, so this was a really great challenge early on, and it proved that taking care of other NPCs, that was by far the hardest part of combat, both early game and late game. This is also where we got the Finger of the Mountain spell, which would become our favorite way of disrespecting the dead, along with our second Mage's Guild recommendation. We traveled back home to the Imperial City after this to join the arena and fight for glory, despite the abuse from Owen. You want to be a combatant? <laughs> Look at you! My granny could beat you and she's dead! Probably true. Wait. Then the road led to Shaden Hall, where we first took a little detour to the Inn of Ill Omen to deal with the old man, Rufio. Goodbye, Rufio! But don't give me that look! You know I was planning on letting you in on this action. Oh yeah, Marina also has an undead ex-boyfriend now. It, We'd recently acquired some new monstrous summon spells that I was eager to test out. Marina wore the proud title Mother of Monsters for a little while, due to her reliance on nasty beasts to save the day. We arrived in Chaden Hall with an ever-growing dark void in our heart, and soon found the sanctuary that Lucian had told us of. Here we met our new family of assassins, and was welcomed into their midst. While in the city, we started up the fighter skill quest line, dealt with some corruption issues, and saved the man from his own painting. Where art thou? <gasps> oh, and the recommendation almost got us drowned in a well. It's all in a day's work for a champion. The journey soon went south to Breville, proud bearer of the title Smelliest City in Cyrodiil. Someone's been murdered! Here we experienced many wild quests, from finding the secret of the forlorn watchman, to diving into the mind of a fellow mage to save him from his nightmare. We eventually got our recommendation from the Guild Hall and headed off towards Leowin, second smelliest city in Cyrodiil. I've heard others say the same. Now, as we've been traveling, i had been looting everything. Whenever we came across a farm, every single cabbage, every single carrot was going in my backpack. And once we reached Leowin, we reaped the benefits of our alchemically incentivized thievery as we reached Master Alchemy in episode 46. This was our first master skill, and this would let us make potions and poisons much more easily. These were a staple of early game combat, and they let us be much more offensive. We just sting the enemy with a poison dagger and then retreat and let a nasty summon punch the living daylights out of them. Leowin had yet another major skilled hall, so we helped them out by defeating a traitorous Nord with the best eyebrows that I think we saw that entire series. The charcoalness in his eyebrows is intensifying. Now, as part of completing all quests, we also had to go and do the Daedric Shrine quests, which held some great rewards in the form of Daedric artifacts. But the issue with them was that many of them had level requirements, and we were still level 6 at this point. 
However, we were able to do some of them, like Shiogorath's quest, which had us terrorize a small village by raining down burning dogs on them. I guess saving the world just takes on a lot of strange forms. The journey went on to Skingrad for a recommendation and some different destruction spells so we could mix and match them later on. And while in the city, we were approached by a paranoid wood elf named Glarthir, who wanted us to stalk some people in the city he claimed was following him. As expected, that whole ordeal ended in bloodshed and a nice lump of gold in our pockets. As we passed by the city of Kavach in episode 56, we were shocked to see it in ruins. Daedra had overrun the city, pouring out of a portal. It was time for Marina to delve into hell to save the world for the first time that series. And this is where the true horror of Oblivion was made plain. Clanfares. That Clanfair just took half my health. These realms really don't mess around when you're playing a squishy mage on max difficulty. However, the sigil stones found at the very end would have some extremely potent effects when we got around to enchanting our own gear. But we'd need to be a higher level for them to reach their true, transcendent states. We helped stop the Siege of Kavach, and we met a priest named Martin, who we knew to be the last living heir of the Emperor. He agreed to come with us to meet Joffrey, and so we had our first companion on an urgent quest to save the world, which by now, as you've guessed, means we took a little dockside vacation trip to Anvil instead. We're supposed to be going back to the Wayne Priory, but Martin, you know me. I just want to go on a little sightseeing trip. Poor Martin Septim had to come along with Marina as she bought a haunted house, stopped a rogue mage for her final recommendation, and got tangled up in a plotline about seductive women messing with the married men in the town. And so, once the dust settled, we had visited every city in Cyrodiil. We'd had a surface level glance at its quests and contents, but now it was time to delve much deeper to take on the quests that I'd been scared to start. But we would need to be stronger to take on the nastier challenges ahead. And so, it was time to head to school. You smell of death. Been conjuring up dead things. Episode 63 was a milestone. We got to explore the Arcane University in the Imperial City and got access to custom spellmaking and custom enchanting. I made some different cheap spells to train my different magical abilities, I made some spells to charm people for better prices and a free ticket out of jail, I made lots of fortify skill spells to make our skills stronger, spells to control beasts and humanoids alike, and of course custom spells that boosted our speed, athletics and acrobatics to shorten our travel time significantly and let us reach new heights. Crip! <laughs> Cast jump! <laughs> This is why I love the major skills. After getting journeyman destruction, we made new weakness spells that played a huge part in letting Marina use offensive magic. Because if we stacked two similar weakness spells by firing them one after another, we'd have a compounding effect with the weakness, meaning the subsequent fireball we tossed out, once the enemy was weakened, would actually start hitting really hard and blast through their max difficulty armor. This was about to get really interesting, as Marina was learning now to be a frontline fighter who actually found companions to be more and more of a nuisance instead of her savior. Oh. This is so good for stealth as well. I sneak in, paralyzed them in the back, and then I just weak, 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 and I just smashed your heads in with that bloody mace. Oh, I am a fan of this. We finally arrived at Wayne Priory in episode 79 and found a place under attack by the Mythic Dawn and we learned that the Amulet of Kings had been taken. Joffrey, now a badass with a katana, joined the party and we actually didn't dally long before heading to Cloud Ruler Temple with Martin and Joffrey where they could lay the plan to recover the amulet and stop the oncoming invasion. For the next batch of episodes, we traveled around Cyrodiil, following guild quests and acquiring more gold and power, only to return to the university at regular intervals for new gear and spells when we felt inspiration strike. As we leveled up, wolves became boars, boars became bears, and what was once a puny imp soon became a mighty minotaur lord. 
And that was the core of the rest of the series. We grew in power, but so did our enemies. So we played with our abilities and constantly honed our skills to stay one step ahead. As we leveled up, quests gave better rewards, the monster variety grew, and my enjoyment of the series was still sky high. This video could really go on for hours. I could talk about the quest where we lost all our gear and suddenly struggled like an infant again in episode 158, or how we survived the epic battle of Bruma in episode 200. But the point of a recap is to not touch on all the small details. You've seen the start of her journey. You've seen her rise to relative power. So instead, I'll narrate the rest of the series with some broader strokes. Let's zoom out and get a bird's eye view of the challenge. Gracious, what a hero! Finish all quests. Oblivion's quests were really the driving force for the whole challenge. They were the backbone, the red thread, the light as we stumbled in the dark. Quests are what drove us from city to city, that made us hunt down alien ruins for artifacts, that gave us reasons to explore hidden nooks and crannies of the province. They gave our adventures some context. There are a total of 204 quests in Oblivion, but some of them can't be completed if you want to complete them all. There are a handful of problematic ones. The Arena, Cast Out of the Thieves Guilds, Eternal Exile, Expelled from the Fighters Guild, and Whispers of Death. Out of these, Cast Out of the Thieves Guild, Eternal Exile, and Expelled from the Fighters Guild are all expulsion quests for different guilds. If you are exiled from the Dark Brotherhood or expelled from the Fighters Guild, it goes without saying that you can't complete the rest of the quests in that faction. Meanwhile, for the Thieves Guild one, you can always buy your way back in, and the quest will never be marked as complete in your quest log. This brings the total amount of completable quests to 201. Now these last two quests, the Arena and Whispers of Death, are repeatable guild reward quests. So when you become a Grand Champion of the Arena, you can come back every week and fight an assortment of monsters for gold, and this quest will remain active in your quest log for the rest of your life. The same goes with Whispers of Death, because after becoming Listener of the Dark Brotherhood, this quest will remind you that you can get a recurring payout by visiting the Night Mother and carrying forth her will. This also never leaves your quest log. However, since I played with the unofficial Oblivion patch, these last two quests are now fixed. They will be marked as complete when they reasonably should, and thus they are completable. So, 201 quests were between us and becoming champion. Main quest, guild quests, main city quests, village and inn quests, the arena, daedric quests, master training quests, and actually a handful of non-journal quests as well. These didn't count towards the overall statistic, but I still wanted to do them. The easiest place to mess up here is definitely the Dark Brotherhood, so be warned. There are four missable quests. So it's very important that you do the extra favor for our Dark Brother Tainava, that you accept Vicente's gift of vampirism, and you even get kicked out of the guild twice just to complete two of the less severe expulsion quests. Do these before the purification quests. The non-journal quests are also really interesting. These are quests that don't appear in your journal, but I still wanted to do. Such as the attack on Fort Such, where we have to protect a legion of guards fighting the Daedra. Or the horror of Dive Rock, where we find a diary and have to uncover the scene of a, of a terrible killing. But how does one actually keep track of these 200 plus quests? I mean... Yes, we have the quest log, but there's no search feature, there's no way to see what episode we did it in, what quests we have yet to do. The answer is spreadsheets. I made spreadsheets for every major completion goal in the game, and I filled in information such as quest name, completion status, and episode it was completed in. This way I could always go back to double check what quests were done and when, providing a great point of reference for myself. I'm going to be leaving links to all of the spreadsheets that I used in the challenge down below, so feel free to go duplicate them and fill them in on your own journey. Since quests was such a pivotal goal, that's also how I ended the series. In episode 250, we wrapped up the main quest, the last content yet to complete in the game. But before we got there, 
There were several other goals we needed to achieve. Master all skills. Oblivion has 21 skills to master. Now, some of them are very quick to train, like alchemy, where one just has to make between 900 and 2000 potions to max it, depending on how you made your class. Now, other skills, like athletics, can take between 32 and 94 hours of grinding to max out, again, depending on your class. I trained most of these skills naturally as I played the game, but some of them I grinded a bit off camera or in sped up montages to get the right level up bonuses. So having outlawed using trainers, we had to gain every bit of experience ourselves, but we did do our best to maximize bonuses like quest rewards and skill book boosts. So we trained athletics to 99, but instead of spending another two hours grinding to max it, we just read an athletics book we've been saving up to push us to 100s. Likewise, we had a plus five bonus to Mercantile waiting as a reward for the Hack Dirt quest, and we only picked it up when we were close to maxing that skill. By far the biggest slogs were Marksman and Speechcraft. Having to tell 6,000 jokes or shoot 12,000 arrows into living creatures, it took its toll on me since I had to focus while performing the tasks to get the optimal experience. Episode 249 is the episode where I finally maxed them all after several days of grinding. Our final level was 53, with all attributes maxed but luck, which is nearly impossible through normal play. Luck also gives no particular benefit to a character with max stats, so I did not consider it worth our time. Find all map markers. I wanted to have a fully completed map with every available icon in the game found. This meant dungeons like caves and camps, but also miscellaneous places that might have little to no content other than the marker, like the Godelsfund Priory. So to show the contrasts, this is our map in episode 1, and this is our map in episode 250. But we didn't just have to find the map markers, we had to clear the associated locations. This was one of the tougher treks of the series, and I ended up live streaming episode 224 to 247 so I could have some live encouragement as we cleared cave after cave in a desperate dash to the finish line. There is no in-game statistic for clear dungeons, so I had to keep a separate spreadsheet for this very reason. I considered a dungeon cleared when every enemy was dead and every chest was looted. We cleared our last dungeon in episode 247, which felt... amazing. I think that was the most demanding of all the tasks of 100%ing this game. Every single dungeon cleared, every single location found, Every map marker that we can get map marked? Thank you, Mr. Goat. It's been gotten! Except for a strange door, of course. Shut all Oblivion gates. After completing the quest, find the air, during the main quest line, Oblivion gates start appearing throughout the land. After the quest Dagon Shrine, even more gates show up. At that point, there are 50 randomly spawned Oblivion Gates waiting that has to be cleared, as well as 10 city-related gates, bringing the total amount of gates we can clear up to 60. The Oblivion Gates are very time-sensitive. If you progress too far in the main quest, past the Paradise quest, no more gates can spawn. Furthermore, if you finish Light the Dragonfires, all active gates are closed. We waited a long time with clearing our first random gates. Not until episode 103 did we start delving into Oblivion again, long after our initial encounter with Daedra and Kavach. And here, I had a conundrum. So, there are 50 random gates we had to clear, but there's only a total of 7 unique worlds it could place us in when we entered. So we would quickly start meeting the same realms over and over again, and it easily took a whole episode or more to clear them early on in the series. So I made a ruling, and I said that once we have cleared an Oblivion world 100%, with all enemies dead, map explored, and loot gained, we could simply speedrun through subsequent iterations of that world, and just rush to the Sigil Tower. 
This way I kept the pace of the episodes up while still feeling like I had cleared everything and it was a good compromise in my eyes. The sigil stones that awaited atop the towers at the end also held incredibly potent enchantments in the late game that made it possible to make incredibly cool custom gear. This is another reason to wait with clearing portals until you're at level 17 or above. We closed our last portal in episode 212 and the world breathed a sigh of relief. And so did we. 60 out of 60 portals cleared. Poor guy, there's nowhere left to go for you now. You're stuck here. That was a daunting goal. What would come next? Own all horses. Whew, okay, so this is one of the easier objectives. There are seven cities that sell horses in the game, so we just had to buy a horse from each city stable to increase the needed statistic. As a side note, we rarely ever used horses in the series, considering our traveling speed in later episodes looked like this. That being said, it was tons of fun to cast Command Creature in a big zone to get several horses as my followers. It works! <laughs> See you later, okay, well, I'm gonna take the horses on a little journey. We bought the final horse in episode 170. Now, this is not counting horses like the Unicorn and Shadowmere, these are just the city horses. It's wonderful, now take good care of it. I know I paid a thousand gold, but... That's Marina's life. Upgrade all houses. Eight cities in Cyrodiil provide houses, but these are rather bare-bones affairs. But with some gold on the counter here and there to grease the wheels, we can upgrade them and turn them into full-blown homes for our character. When all eight houses are upgraded, this criteria is met. We achieved this in episode 114, and then subsequently only used our waterfront shack, despite having a beautiful mansion in Skingrad with a personal servant. Marina's a humble girl. Invest in all stores. Investing in all stores, it's not a particularly hard objective, but it must be done mindfully. So, there are 99 merchants in the base game. Of these, all but 5 can be invested in. These exceptions are Kalindil, Edgar Vatrine, Ernest Manus, Mirage Dar, and Ungarion. However, with the unofficial Oblivion patch, some changes are made. Ungarion's store can once again be invested in. The same fix is also applied to Edgar Vitrine, Ernest Manus, and Kalindil. This means we have 98 merchants we can invest in, but there is a catch. Sadrasa and Ungorm are both listed as merchants in the base game, but they aren't meant to be merchants. Therefore, the unofficial Oblivion patch just removes their merchant capabilities altogether, and our total amount of merchants to invest in is 96, with the only exceptions being Mirage Dar, Sidrasa, and Engorm. To invest in a store, one must have 75 in the Mercantile skill, and then you must give the selected merchant 500 golds. This gold will now increase that shop's max barter money, which is a pretty good long time investment. So we travel around the world as soon as we got the invest perk in episode 95, because there are five merchants that you need to keep your eye on. Selena Orania, Andreas Draconis, Kirsten, Etira, and Vlanholder. They are all merchants who will inevitably feel the cold hand of death during the completion of the game's quests, so these five are really important to do early on. We invested in our final merchant in episode 184, and if you wish to see the full list of who, where, and when we did it, there will be a spreadsheet in the description. You're gonna be spending around 50,000 gold on these merchants, but that's just a drop in the bucket if you're a loot hoarder. Marina Mistfire's final gold amount was 1.7 million, a stark contrast to the start of the game where every gold piece was a treasure. Collect all Nurnroot plants. <sighs> Nernroots are non-respawnable plants found near bodies of water, and there were 306 of them in the base game. And we had to collect every single one. Now Nernroots are split into two categories, interior and exterior. The 43 interior Nernroots are found around people's homes, 
no real big issue there. However, keeping track of the 263 exterior ones, that was the main challenge. Here's how it went. I found a map online outlining the locations of each Nurn route. I had this open on the side as I played, so I could adjust my travel routes to hit as many as possible. And later during editing, when I collected one, I would write down the location of the plant I found with a timestamp for when I collected it. I also included the plant's ID, found by zooming in on an interactive Oblivion map that I will have linked below. And furthermore, I would also cross out each Nurn route on the map as we went along, labeling each cross with the number of the collected Nurn routes. This way, there will be no confusion about which plant was gathered. Or so I thought. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Blackwood. About 40 of the Nurn routes we needed were all gathered in this one swampy place. The issue was that everything looked exactly the same. How could I differentiate this Nurn route from this Nurn route? So, this process involved a lot of numbering, careful measuring and focused searching, but I'm proud to say that in episode 213 we picked the last of the cursed Nurn routes. Oh my gosh, that was a sneaky one. Collect all skill books. A skill book is a book that can be read once to permanently increase a character's level in a skill. This skill must be below 100 for the book to take effect. Out of all the criteria, this one was among the scariest initially, simply due to the nature of random chance. There were 109 skill books to read and collect, 89 of which were in set locations around the game. Other than the occasional quest-sensitive book, the location-specific books were not too bad to keep track of. But the remaining 20 skill books could only be found in random loot. As I touched on earlier, there is a 10% chance that a skill book will appear in a legible boss chest, and the type of book you get, it depends on the dungeon. For example, let's say we want a specific magic book from a chest. First, we need to find a dungeon that gives us magic books, like a conjurer or a necromancer dungeon. Then, we'd need to make it to the boss chest at the end of the dungeon. Then, we'd need to hit the 10% chance to get a skill book. Then, it would roll to give us a skill book from all available magic skill books, of which there are 7, so we'd have a 1 in 7 chance to get the skill book we desired, a 14% chance. So, all in all, add those percentages together, and once we opened the chest, there was a 1.4% chance we'd have the book we desired. So having to hit that 1.4% chance 20 times? Part of me was scared that I would just n never end up finding all the books that I wanted, but I devised a method that gave me very good results. So in episode 248, I decided to hunt down the final skill books, by analyzing the dungeons that we had cleared throughout the game to find the ones with the most optimal boss chest placement. I would quick save outside the best entrance, rush in, check the chest, and quick load if I didn't get the desired result. Now the boss chest's contents is generated when you enter the zone, so finding dungeons with a quick access to boss chests is really useful. An example of this is Seat Tatar, an alien ruin with a secret back entrance straight to the boss chest. I am feeling good about this because if you take a look right here, you can see Marina freaking Mistfire merchandise. And when that adorns your body, your powers of oblivion playing is increased tenfold. And that means there's a skill book in this chest. Oh, Marina! You, you can't stage that. You can't stage that was like 13 attempts. Looking back at it, while the skillbook hunt was, yes, yeah, tedious and nerve-wracking at times, it, it did add that little bit of excitement to every dungeon we cleared. And in the end, just sitting back and looking at that beautiful list of books in our chests, that was satisfying. I should probably get around to reading them one day. Slay all unique enemies of Cyberdil. So, what is a unique enemy? Well, for this one I counted creatures that there was only one copy of, and that weren't tied directly to a quest's completion. Creatures like the Uderfruch the Matron, the Lich Erendur Vangaril, the Ghost of Perennia Draconis, the Spectral Mudcrab, etc. 
There is a list on the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages that detail these further, and I will link it down below. Other completables. Besides the criteria I just mentioned, we were also on the lookout for 13 Birth Sign Stones and 7 Heaven Stones. Now, Heaven Stones are ancient monoliths that grant us permanent greater powers if we have the right fame requirements. And Birth Sign Stones have no requirement, but we can only have one stone's greater power at any given time. And most of them suck. We also completed the pilgrimage of the nine way shrines, meaning we visited the way shrines of each divine to receive their blessing. And the different greater powers that we amassed definitely came in handy during some of the game's tougher encounters. Ooh, that's look at that greater power we just got. Fortify all of our stats, 10 points for 5 minutes. And those are the objectives I set for myself. Those are the criteria I chose for my 100% challenge. And after 200 hours of in-game time, I had completed them. But could I say I truly completed the game? Drunk with madness. Madness for all! What constitutes 100% completion? Well, you'd probably lump in max all skills and do all quests, right? But what about talking to every NPC? What about collecting every piece of armor, every different enchantment on a weapon? What about eating one of every food or drinking one of every wine? This, I think, is the beauty and terror of a self-made challenge, because you decide the finish line. You get to say, this is complete. There are a million arbitrary objectives I could have added, and honestly, some I think maybe I should have tried. For example, what about collecting one of every regular book, or eat one of every food? The main reason I chose not to do these things is because, well, they didn't have a statistic. In the menu, you can find a bunch of numbers representing your deeds, and this does include a list for books read. But whenever you read any book, even if you read it before, this increases, so it's, it's worthless. There was no real way of knowing which book had you read before without having a separate list. It was the same with eating food, there was no in-game way to track that. In contrast, my own criteria, they were usually things that the game acknowledged, and that was very satisfying to me. I could see how many neuron roots I had, I could see how many quests I had completed, I could see how many skill books I had read. It meant I was less likely to mess up my tracking of that criteria. I gotta be honest, there are times where, I'm, where I doubt, where I think, is this really that impressive what we've done? I should have done all of these other things and I should have collected all the armors, all the weapons, all the... But no, I'm satisfied with the rules I set, the restrictions I gave and the results that we got. One could say that four years is a long time to spend to achieve 200 hours of playtime and they'd be right. But we didn't rush this series. It wasn't just about completing the game, it was about making a memorable series. I played Oblivion when I had energy to put on a good show and when I had planned our next grand adventure. This way, it was never a chore. Well, beside the dungeon clear, and the Nurn roots, and most of the skill grinds. But seeing my character reach max stats, it gave me a deep sense of satisfaction that topped anything I've ever felt in video games. Marina's grown, I have grown, and hopefully you have grown too. So this is it. This is the end. Have a still good day, take care, and stay awesome. Hmm. You didn't think I'd forgotten about the DLC now, did you? Right now, I'm planning Marina Mistfire's next adventure in the Champion of DLC Challenge, where we will take on all of Oblivion's DLC, and we will do it 100%. Maybe even incorporating new completion goals retroactively. Her story is not over yet, so stay tuned to the channel to take part in it. Down in the description you'll find links to playlists, spreadsheets, and other resources to forge your own Oblivion challenge. May your adventures be as enthralling as Marina's were. These last four years have been magical, so let's continue that magic. 
Have a still good day, take care, and stay awesome. But most importantly, everybody, stay dark. Goodbye.